Good morning, everyone. Today, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker. He is all the way from the well in Kingsburg. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Coleman. What's up, guys? <laughs> woo! I got one woo. That was pretty cool. Who was my wooer? Raise your hand. Anyone? No? You don't? All right. I guess it wasn't that important. Hey, guys, real quick, before we get started, I need you to take out one piece of paper and a writing utensil. Can you do that? One piece of paper and a writing utensil. I know you all have backpacks. You don't have a piece of paper? Grab one from a buddy. We're going to share together. And if you're looking at me with a grumpy little look, I don't want to do that. Do it anyway. Because I know junior hires, you have attitude, right? Guys, I'm going to do it too. Front row, you need paper? There you go, bro. All right, guys, give one hot dog and one hamburger fold. Hamburger is this way. Or burrito and taco, I don't know what you want to call it. So that when you fold your paper, you have four, like, four sections. Does that make sense? And then unfold it. These are really simple instructions. I tried this with my four-year-old this morning. He could do it. So you've got this. All right, you all there? Oh, no, I just dropped it. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to pray. You can keep folding. Do it quietly. All right, Heavenly Father, Lord. Father, uh, we believe the truth that we just sang. We believe your name is beautiful. We believe your name is powerful. And Father, uh, we, we want to be echoes of that in the world around us. We want to be a people. We want to be a people who realize that this new life that you've given us is not something that we just sit in, but this new life you've given us is something that we move in, that we're active in, that the gospel and what you've called us to is not just something we believe. It is something we do, and we thank you in your grace and in your glory for calling us to partner with you in that. So, Father, today as we look at, as we look at who we are, or better yet, we look at who you say we are, Father, would we realize, would we truly realize what are the most important things in our life are? Would we realize the truth of what your word has to say about that? And, Father, would that truth shape who we are and what we do and what we think and how we act and what we say and the way we live in this world around us so that people could see you in us. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Guys, take your sheet, and I want you to do this. I don't know you. Some of you I know, many of you I don't. What I want you to do, I've never met you, and I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me about yourself. Four things about yourself. It could be an ambition you have. It could be something you're good at. It could be a hobby that you have. Four things about yourself on this sheet. Write them down. Four things. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it as if I was in high school, okay? Four things. Four things about yourself. One in each square. One in each square. Just a few more seconds. Just a few more seconds. Tell me about yourself. Four things about four things about yourself. All right. If you've done it, hold it up and look at me. If you've done it, hold it up and look at me. All right, guys, I wrote these four things. I don't know what yours are. Maybe you wrote, I'm an athlete. I'm a basketball player, football player, tennis player. Maybe you wrote, I like music. I'm a musician. I make music. I write music. I sing music. Maybe, bring it in. Bring it in. Maybe you wrote something you want to achieve. Maybe you wrote, I want to be a valedictorian. I want to go to this school. Maybe you wrote a hope or a dream or a profession that you want to do. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a teacher. I want to be an astronaut. I don't know. Do, do you guys still want to be astronauts, or is that done in, like, fourth grade? Anyone want to be an astronaut? No? All right. These are the things I wrote. If you had asked this question, tell me about yourself when I was in high school, I would have wrote this. I would have told you this. I'm a trombone player. I played trombone in high school. Some, someone just laughed at me. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I was really popular. The ladies thought it was really cool that I played trombone. Not really. Uh, the other thing, I, love, I loved and still love reading. I just, I've always loved reading. I've always loved books. Uh, so it's something I've always been about. I've always loved reading. I would have told you that. The other thing I would have told you, I would have told you I love Yosemite. I love national parks. I love being outside. I love, I love seeing, seeing big trees and big rock faces and walking through them. And the other thing I would have told you, which I think a lot of you in this room can relate to, 
I love food. Amen? And if you've probably know this about me already. I've been here a few times. Even at this age, my favorite food in the world was tacos. So I love tacos. Those are probably four things I would have told you about myself. If you go to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to go through it real quick, we're going to see... Bring it in. In Philippians chapter 3, we're going to see a few things. We're going to see Paul. We're going to see Paul tell us four things about himself. And we're going to see him tell us what those things about himself, what those things about himself mean. So if you could go there, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, that would be fantastic. Let me flip there real quick, and then we'll get there. You can follow along on the screen. You can follow along the screen. That's awesome, too. Philippians chapter 3, starting in, this, starting in verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi. And he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are of the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh Verse 4, though I myself has re- have reason to put confidence in the flesh. I'm going to start right, stop right there in that first half of verse 4. What is he saying? That's a weird phrase. Do not put confidence, do not put confidence in the flesh. Though I myself also have reason to put confidence in the flesh. What do you think Paul's saying when he says that? It's a strange thing. We don't talk that way, do we? What Paul's about to tell us is he's about to tell us his four things. Paul, for us, is going to answer the question, tell me about yourself, and he's going to give us his four things. And he tells us right off the bat, he's giving us a hint why he's telling us these things. And he's saying, he's asking the question or or telling us not to put our confidence, not to put our hope or our trust or, or the hope for our future in these four things. And what I love, he says here, he doesn't go, hey, guys, don't do this because I never do this and I'm perfect. He goes, guys, don't do this. And he raises his hand. And he goes... Guys, I struggle with this too. I'm not good at this either. I put confidence, I put confidence and hope and trust into the things that I do, into the ambitions, into the ambitions that I have. And Paul raises his hand and he says, I do this too. And he says, though though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Further on in verse four, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. What Paul just tell us, he's like, hey, I put down four things, and the four things I put down, not only am I really good at them, among my peers, I was the best at them. The four things I wrote down in my group of people, there was no one that was better than me at these four things. So even though I, that you might have confidence in the flesh, I, I would have more. And he goes on in here, and he says, he was circumcised on the eighth day. If you don't know what that is, go talk to, uh, go talk to Mr. Thomas. How about that? Go talk to Mr. Thomas about that one. No, you don't want that one? (laughs) All right. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, He was circumcised on, uh, oh, lost my spot. One, take a breath. Here we go. (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. What's Paul saying there? He's going through his, Jesus, he's going through his Jewish heritage, and he goes, Hey guys, I was circumcised like I was supposed to be as a kid on the eighth day. That makes me, that makes me Jewish. And I was, a, I, was of, uh, I was of this tribe. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. That makes me even more Jewish. And even among Hebrews, even among all the Jewish, I was like extra Jewish. So the first thing Paul would have written on his sheet, he would have gone, I'm not just Jewish. I'm super Jewish, and I'm more Jewish than the rest of my friends. The way this would work in our lives is when people start stories and they're like, I grew up in the church. I was baptized when I was two days old. I know everything about everything. I've never missed Sunday school. I go to everything. I'm at every church event. I'm there for Wednesday night potlucks. I'm at every youth group meeting. I volunteer. It's that. He's saying, hey, look, I grew up in the church. It'd be like us saying, oh, I'm super, I'm super Christian, right? And so that's what he's saying. 
That's what he's saying there. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's his first thing. I'm super Jewish. The next thing he says, according to the law of Pharisee. The law for these Jewish people was basically our Bible, first five books, first five books, and then following uh, of, of, the, of the Old Testament. And he says, according to that, according to knowing that and understanding that, I was a Pharisee. These Pharisees are like the elite. These Pharisees are the best and the brightest of this Jewish community. They're, they're like functionally like Jewish lawyers and politicians and leaders. And they're there because they're super, super, super smart. This is the person that goes, I have like a Bible verse memorized for every book of the Bible. I can tell you every book of the Bible in order without singing some goofy song. I can tell it to you backwards and forwards. I can tell you themes. I can tell you characters. I really know, I really know my Bible. That's his number two. The next one, he goes on, he says, as to zeal, verse 6, a persecutor of the church. He goes, look, I was so Jewish and so excited about the Bible, and I was so zealous. That's another word for like enthusiastic or passionate. I was so zealous about this that anyone who wasn't Jewish, I wanted to fight. Anyone who wasn't Jewish, I wanted, I wanted to make their life miserable, and so he kind of picked on this this group of people, this tiny little church, this group of people who were now following Jesus and they weren't following traditional Jewish customs. They were saying, hey, I think, I think we need to do something different. And he says, I was so, I was so good at being Jewish and I knew my, I knew my, my Jewish Bible so well. I was, I was zealous, I was passionate. I was so passionate that I just picked fights with anyone who wasn't Jewish. And the last thing he says is this, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. As to following the commandments of God, he says, I was really good at it. I was really good at keeping Ten Commandments. I was really good at keeping Torah. I was, I was a good kid. In our context, this is the person who like never gets in trouble, right? We all know that person. By the way, I was that person when I was in junior high and high school. I just, I, I was a good kid. I never did naughty things. I never snuck out of the house. I never did anything my parents didn't ask me to. I just, I followed the rules. And that's what Paul's saying. He said, look, I followed, I followed the rules. If you were to look at Paul's four things that he's written right now, knowing what you know about him right now, would you say he's successful? Would you say he's successful? Look, he's super Jewish. There's no one more Jewish than him. He knows his law so well that he's been invited into this elite group of like lawyers and politicians. He's so zealous that he wants to pick a fight with anyone who's not Jewish. And according to his obedience, he's blameless. Has, has Paul done good? He's been successful. I think he has. I think it's interesting as we look at success and particularly as we talk about success for the next generation, there's a group of people, and you've probably heard things like this, that they fear that you won't succeed. They fear that the people in this room are going to somehow fail society or fail themselves. And you hear comments like this from people who are like older and they have gray hair and they sit around and they shake their fists and they go, kids these days, they're entitled. They're lazy. They're arrogant. They don't do anything. They expect everything to be done for them. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true of this generation. I think you're really smart. I think you're really driven. I think you care about things in an incredible way. Now, what you care about changes rapidly, right? But I think you do care about things, and having thought that, I don't think you're going to fail. I actually think, in probably in large part, in some of the four things that you wrote down, that the mass majority of the people in this room, they're going to succeed. You're going to be successful. Some of you may have written down ambitions that you have, and I believe that, man, if you want to be a doctor, you're probably going to do it. And if you want to be an elite athlete, you're probably going to do it. I don't think you're going to fail. I think you're going to succeed. And so we look, we look at these things, and we look at what Paul's written, and I think it's fascinating as we go on, as we go on in verse 7, he, he, he tells us what he thinks about those things. And what he thinks about his four things and what those mean to his life. And he says this, But whatever gain I had, I count them as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord for his sake. I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. What does Paul say about his four things? As he looks at his list, what does he say? 
What does he say is the most important? Does he go, hey, it's really important that I'm super Jewish? Hey, it's really important that I'm a Pharisee, that I know law better than anyone. Hey, it's super important that as you look at, as you look at my obedience to the law, I was perfect, and it's super important how zealous and passionate I was. Is that what he says here? No, it isn't. What does he say is the most important thing? Knowing Jesus Christ. I love, I love what he says. Indeed, verse 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, I count them as rubbish that I might gain more Christ. What Paul does is he looks at his sheet and he goes, for a little more Jesus, I'd throw it all away. For knowing more Jesus, I'd crumple it up and I'd, I'd throw it all away. It's nothing but trash to me. It's nothing, it's nothing but rubbish. It's nothing but rubbish to me. I look at my Judaism. I look at my, how, how I'm a Pharisee. I look at my zeal that I have and I look at my obedience that I have and I'm going to, I'm going to throw it all away. Guys, what is the most important thing to you? What is the most important thing to you right now? For someone in this room, the most important thing in this world to you is plastic straws and sea turtles. <laughs> it's true, you laugh, you laugh, but for someone in this room that is absolutely true and you think you and your hydro flask are gonna save the world. The scary thing is, shh, bring it in. The scary thing is, bring it in. The scary thing is that that doesn't bother you and it should. It doesn't bother you, and it should. For other, of you in this, for other of you in this room, the most important thing in this world for you right now is some relationship. In fact, there's someone in this room, you've been in school, what, all of like 30 days, 28 days? How many weeks of school have you had? Four or five? There's someone in this room who's on their second boyfriend or girlfriend after school starting. There's someone in this room who is. What, what is the most important thing to you? Bring it in. What is the most important thing to you? That's the most important thing to you. And the scary thing is, is it doesn't bother you. And it should. And there are other people in this room who the most important thing is maybe something you wrote on that sheet. Athletic success. Academic achievement. You want to be popular. You want to be accepted. That's the most important thing to you. And that doesn't bother you. And it should. that we take all of these things in our lives, we take even things that we're good at, these things on our sheets, and we go, they're more, they're more important than Jesus. Guys, I said to you that I'm not afraid that you're gonna fail. I don't. I'm not worried that this generation is going to, going to fail. What I'm worried is that this generation is going to succeed in something that ultimately doesn't matter. What terrifies me is that many of you in this room are going to succeed in something that means nothing, and that doesn't bother you, and it should, because this thing you hold in your hand is the most important. These four things are the most important. What I don't want you to hear today is that you should take these four things and throw it away. I just want to go through Paul's life as we close, and I want to look at these things, and I want to look at what Paul says. He doesn't say that I'm going to take these things and they're not important. He says that in light of who Jesus is, Jesus is so much better than all of these things that when I compare these things to who Jesus is, these four things become what? Trash. That's when I compare them to who Jesus is. He says the surpassing glory of Jesus Christ. When I compare them to Jesus, they become trash. But he doesn't say they're not important, which I think is interesting. And if you unfold this, maybe you crumpled yours up too. And if you look at it, and if we look at Paul, his first thing was what? He's super Jewish. Did you know that Paul being super Jewish gave him access to synagogues, which gave him an opportunity to share with Jewish people who Jesus was and that Jesus was actually the thing that they'd been hoping for and looking for from the beginning, that he was the answer to law? Was it not important that Paul was Jewish? It, 
it was important. Did how important it was change when Jesus became the most important? It absolutely did, and it became something that Paul now used to give him access to a group of people so he could tell them about Jesus. Some of you on your sheet wrote something like soccer, basketballs, I don't know, whatever you wrote. That gives you access to a group of people, and it is important. The next thing that Paul wrote was that he was a Pharisee. It was important that Paul knew his Bible really well, so as he went to Jewish people, he could very clearly and elegantly explain to them, using his vast knowledge of the Old Testament, that this guy, Jesus, is the one that we've been waiting for. And that's why that was important. And because Jesus became the most important, how he used that changed. And then he took this zeal and this passion that he had for destroying the church, and he took that exact same zeal and passion, and he put it into growing and building and establishing and spreading the gospel so that the church of Jesus Christ would grow and so that more people would know about him. And then he takes this last thing he had, this dedication to obedience, and rather than being obedient to serving the law and making sure that he crossed all of his I's and dot all of his T's and that he was a good kid, He put that same dedication to giving his life to Christ. And Paul uses this phrase over and over and over again as he talks about himself. He says, I am a slave to Christ. It's not my life. It's not my life anymore, but it's Jesus' life. And I'm going to obediently, out of dedication, give that life to him. So it's not that those things became trash or rubbish. It's just in light of who Jesus was, they weren't worth much. But when he took who Jesus was and he paired those things and he combined those things with the four things he wrote, it made Paul one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever seen. It made Paul one of the greatest authors the world has ever seen. It made Paul one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever seen. Guys, what's going to happen when Jesus Jesus becomes the most important thing in your life? And he takes the four things you wrote down. What's going to happen when you do it? Paul was one person. What are there, 300 people in this room? You could turn your school upside down. You could turn your teams upside down. You could turn your youth groups, your community groups, your neighborhoods upside down if Jesus became the most important thing. Students, I'm not afraid that you're going to fail. I'm terrified that Jesus isn't the most important thing in your life. And if he's not, I promise you this, you will succeed in something that ultimately doesn't matter. Are we ready to get after it? Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Father, we thank you for an example of Paul and his four things. And Father, as we look at our four things, could, we, could Paul be an example to us? Could we go, hey, these four things, it's not that they're not important. It's that, Jesus, you're so important. You're so important. Your glory is so surpassing. Your value and your importance is so surpassing that when I look at my four things, they just look like trash. And they're just not that impressive anymore. And Father, man, if there's someone in this room who they're going, geez, man, Jesus, you're not my most important thing. Man, I pray that they could be encouraged. That just because that was this morning, it doesn't mean that it has to be true this afternoon. And Father, I pray that you would work in all of our hearts because I believe that all of us could make you more important. I believe all of us could make Jesus more prominent in our lives. And I believe that as we do that, you're going to take those four things we wrote down and you're going to use those four things for your glory to do a magnificent, incredible, and amazing things for your sake so that you could use us to show more people about who Jesus is. So, Father, I pray that in humility, everyone in this room could take those four things and they could lay them at your feet. And they could go, Jesus, you're the most important thing. And now, Jesus, I want you to take these things and I want you to use them for your sake and your kingdom and for your glory. And it's to that end that we pray. It's in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Let's all thank Coleman for coming and speaking to us today.